13 people out of this multitude. Good morning. Good morning. It's a joy that you have chosen to come in today's hall and today praise a significant spiritual law as we focus on the Word of God, the eternal Word of God, with the desire of hearing His voice to receive divine instruction to help us know how to live in our temporal being before ultimately He falls the earth. We began a journey, for the sake of those who have not been here, we began a journey of scripture engagement. Would you say scripture engagement? On Friday, based on the study of the first book of Timothy, and among others, we have identified uh, deep enduring biblical lessons from chapters 1 to chapter number 3. And now allow me to tell for the sake of helping uh, those who have just joined the now to hear in summary what the Lord is saying. We have heard the Lord tell us that the ministry is the result of the grace and the gifting of God. Number two, that false teachers must be dealt with the ruthlessly in the church. I was waiting for a response on that one. Yes. False teachers must be dealt with the ruthlessly. Number three, that effective church worship is focused on a global ministry seeking for peace, godliness, holiness, salvation, and knowledge of truth among all men. Number four, that both men and women have God-given roles that should not be allowed to conflict in the church. And number five, that church leadership demands more of being than doing. That is, it demands a focus on character other than on aptitude or skill. Number six, we say that effectiveness in leadership, in leading one's family, is a foundational qualification for church leadership. And because most of you are young, we added and said, whoever you will marry will decide to a greater extent your qualification to enter into the ministry and spiritual leadership. And number seven, finally, we say that one, only one practical skill is required for church leadership. That is the ability to teach because church leadership, the ministry in the church is primarily the ministry of the word and therefore beyond character, only the skill, the ability to handle the word of God correctly is required. And in this is our final session, which is first for most of you, we shall focus on how to defend the integrity of the church, how to de defend the integrity of the church, and of course, the integrity of our own faith in the Lord Jesus Christ by what I have called defending the integrity of the church. So those who are taking notes, the topic is defending the integrity of the church. We shall be gleaning or squeezing powers of divine truth from 1 Timothy chapters 4, 5, and 6. As we shall notice in a short while, the process of defending the integrity of the church is largely one of guarding against false doctrine or diligently engaging in nurturing our individual faith. Therefore, so that you do not lose it in the, my middle words, the process of defending the integrity of the church is the process of dealing, guarding against false doctrine in the church. Well, at the same time, diligently engaging in nurturing your own individual faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we shall consider a number of uh, truths uh, as the Lord gives us wisdom. I want to invite my leaders to come and help us read the scriptures for this is according to Godly teaching. In fact, one of the things that we'll find in the passage is a command to devote ourselves 
to public reading of scripture. So right now what we're going to do is public reading of scriptures. Praise, we are in fasting of the chapter 4. Those who dare to bring your Bibles, whether it's the manual or electronic, we are in fasting of the chapter 4 and we begin reading now. The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and fully know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus brought up in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wise tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things. Holding promise for both the present life and the life to come, this is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. And for this we labor and strive, that we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, and especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them, so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, they should learn first of all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. The widow who is really in need and, and left alone puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. But the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even when she lives. Give the people this instruction so that no one may be open to blame. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied faith and is worse than an, an unbeliever. No widow may be put on the list of widows unless she is over 60, has been faithful to her husband and is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the Lord's people, helping those in trouble and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. As for younger widows, do not put them on such a list, for when they are for when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry. Thus, they, they bring judgment on themselves because they have broken their first pledge. Besides, they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house. And not only do they become idlers, but also busybodies who talk nonsense, saying things they ought not to. So I cancel young widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Some have in fact already turned away to follow Satan. If any woman is a believer has widows in her care, if any woman who is a believer has widows in her care, she should continue to help them and not let the church be burdened with them, so that the church can help those widows who are really in need. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work in, is preaching and teaching. For scripture says, do not muzzle an ox when it is treated out to the grain, 
and the worker deserves his wages. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. But those elders who are sinning, who are sinning, you are to reprove before everyone, so that the others may take warning. I charge you in the sight of God and, and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favorism. Do not be hasty in the laying on of, of hands and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and frequent illnesses. The sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those that, that are not obvious cannot remain hidden forever. All who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect, so that God's name in our teaching may not be slandered. Those who have believing masters are not to show less respect for them because they are brothers. Instead, they are to serve them even better because those who benefit from their service are believers and dear to them. These are the things you are to teach and urge on them. If anyone teaches false doctrines and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to Godly teaching, he is conceited and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means of financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money, some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with griefs. With griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called when you were, when you made your when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Portia's pilot made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone in immortal and who, who lives in an approachable, approachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in their wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides with who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and in so doing have wandered from the faith. Grace be with you. Thank you. Let's appreciate them. For many of you, that is punishment. Reading three chapters together. Our Father and our God, we ask that you may speak to us and give us ears to hear your voice. We pray, O oh God, that you may tune our hearts to your heart. We pray, dear Father, that you may enlarge our hearts to accommodate the truth of your word. And ask, dear Lord, that you may bypass my limited, uh, my faltering words, 
and by your spirit impart truth in the heart of mind of every person here today according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Defending the integrity of the church. Number one, that is what I'm giving you now, is how to do it. Number one, design the reality and depth of apostasy in our day. Design the reality and depth of apostasy in our day. From chapter 4, verses 1 up to 10, we are given a very clear and grim picture of the reality of the falling away of faith in the last days. And the last days is the period where we are in since the first church, the early church, and before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In very unambiguous terms, we are told that the Spirit clearly says, I think the King James says, the Spirit expressly says, in other words, there is no doubt that in later times, some will abandon the faith, and after abandoning the faith, they will follow deceiving spirit and being stored by demons. And this is a scare for me. If we are to defend the integrity of the church, we must then de de develop the ability to design the reality that is an ongoing apostasy, an ongoing falling away from the faith by men and women who have been in the faith. And when they fall away from the faith, they are not just going out to the world, they are not going back into sin. And this means that we need to recognize this prophecy about a great falling away from the faith in the last days. What I would like to persuade you to understand is that this is a prophetic utterance that before the coming of Jesus Christ, there shall be great falling away from the faith. And you come with that understanding that when you are in the faith as I am, there is a risk of falling away from that faith. And consciously then, we walk in discernment, trying to design any appearance of apostasy so that we can turn away from it. And this means that we understand the increase of deceiving spirits, increase of deceiving spirits leading to mushrooming of cows. All cows are as a result of deceiving spirits. Roho Daganifu. There is the Holy Spirit who ministers and mediates the truth of God's word. But apart from the Holy Spirit are many, many other spirits. Somebody has said, Roho Nwengi, Moja Ntakatifu, Wengine Ntakatifu, Wengine Watakatifu, Nakadarika. But many Christians do not understand the days. They only think that anything spiritual comes from the Holy Spirit. Here we are being warned that they are also deceiving spirit. And their law is to deceive God's people away from following the path of faith into following another truth. And this other truth leads to something that looks Christian, but indeed is not Christian itself, it is a coward. But secondly, alongside that, is to recognize the presence of doctrines of demons. And this is scary. Can you see it in your Bible? I asked a question. Can you see it in your Bible? Doctrines taught by demons. That people who have worshipped God at one stage in their life will depart away, they will fall away in the great apostasy. And they will even give heed to doctrines taught by demons. And doctrines of demons are the ones that lead to what today is called occult, occultic practices and belief systems that people would even go ahead to give themselves to beliefs and religious practices that are all themselves anointed by the devil and mediated by his demonic host. And we are being warned, this we must recognize and take care. We must discern when demons are at work, even when it looks innocent and 
perhaps my, uh, misguided or covered as a system of worship. Subsequently, we need to understand the ministry of false teachers who come as hypocritical liars, as we have read in the Bible. They come as hypocritical liars. False prophets do not come and declare in Nairobi City, I am a false prophet. No, they come as ministers of the truth. They hold the scriptures, but be in, inside of them, they are hypocritical. They are liars. They are dishonest. They are ministry and the spirit at work in them is the spirit of hypocrisy. And what they speak, they are lies disguised as the truth. And what we need to do is to understand their ministry. So that when they appear, we can look and tell that man, that woman appears to be a servant of God. But analyzing their ministry, we hear a deceiving spirit at work. We hear lies and therefore we see hypocrisy other than the truth of God. And subsequently deny them space or save ourselves from their influence and ministry so that we may defend the integrity of our faith. In verse 7 of chapter 4, we are given an interesting command. Have nothing to do with God dressed means and old wise tales, rather train yourself to be godly. Most of these false prophets and hypocritical liars thrive on God dressed means and old wise tales. Mahadibi, you know, they are preoccupied with mysteries trying to find a newer or deeper truth, which indeed is a division from the basic simple truth of the word of God. The word of God is extremely true. Not even the fool will miss the highway of holiness, whether we know the interpretation of the book of Daniel or the book of Revelation, whether we know the interpretation of certain funny visions and dreams or not. Some things are extremely clear. He came to his own, but his own did not believe in him. But as many as believed in him, he gave them the power to become the children of God. For God has so loved the world that he has given his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall be saved. Those things are simple. They do not need a lot of interpretation. They do not need a new revelation by a new hypocritical, deceived, false prophet. And the Bible tells us that we should have nothing to do with such men and women. Rather, we give ourselves to the truth. Point number two from chapter four is that we are command, we command and teach true doctrine. Command and teach true doctrine. How do we defend the integrity of the child? By commanding and teaching true doctrine, as we see in verses 12 to 16. Under this, we are told to be an example. Verse number 12. Do not let anyone look down on you because you are young. And this is fitting in a university setting. But set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. How do we command and teach true doctrine? By setting an example in our own lives, an example of doctrine, of godliness. And five things are given there that we all to raise examples in terms of godliness, in terms of speech, in terms of life, in terms of purity, in terms of faith. And as we become such examples, then we begin to command the same. We begin to teach the same so that we can work dog the work and the ministry of false teachers so that we can defend the church and God's people from the corruption of ungodliness, the corruption of a faith that is not pure, the corruption of 
of a faith that generates speech that is not holy and wholesome in the presence of God. I'm talking to Kenyans in a, a time of difficult and certain political environment. But you know, perhaps better than I do, the amount of unwholesome speech that is being spilled forth in our political environment. And I dare say, by men and women who this morning were gathered in one church or another, because their speech has not been seasoned by the truth, because they have given themselves to falsehood, but the Lord calls us to be an example that our speech will be godly and holy so that we can silence all that mchongoano, all that hate speech to the glory of God. If I had the ability, I would tell the National Commission on Cohesion, the struggle against hate speech is not to arrest those who are propagating hate speech, rather is to allow Kenyans become examples in their speech, which only comes by the ministry of the grace of God and the mediation of the Holy Spirit through teaching of true doctrine. How do we command and teach true doctrine? By devoting ourselves to reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching as we read in verse 13. This is the most art in the churches of Jesus Christ in our present day Kenya. When is the last time you heard your church, your pastor, or even in this Christian union, significant time being devoted to the reading of scripture? The devil through the ministry of hypocritical riots seems to have deceived the Christians and the church from the pastors and the preachers and the ministers that the most anointed preacher is the one who reads the shortest verse Verse 7e. <laughs> and then puts the Bible away and goes on a hysterical engagement for the next two hours speaking ideas that we do not know where they come from. No wonder people go to church and they are being told about the Mahiwa Mahiti Nawa Mano. You know what those means? The ones that we said earlier on. Bringing men's godless means because the word of God has been put aside. If we are to teach true doctrine, we must devote ourselves to the reading of scripture at a personal level. And when the church comes together to the public reading of scripture to instruct God's people that the word of God can go beyond science and art and the theories created by men and women such that the word of God can superintend every other fact. They are facts, but only truth is found in the word of God. And how finally do we command and teach true doctrine by nurturing and functioning in spiritual gifts? Nurturing and functioning in spiritual gifts. And spiritual gifts are basically divine graces, divine enablements that allow an ordinary human being to function beyond their natural ability. Because something divine is at work in them by the grace and the hand of God. We need, my brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, easier to defend the integrity of the church. There is need for something divine to be seen at work so that the world is persuaded that in the church, God is at work among his people by the evidence of the operation of spiritual gifts. We are doing well by the grace of God. Number three, how do we defend the integrity of the church? By upholding God's relationships with all people. Upholding God's relationships with all people. We read in chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, Do not rebuke another man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, 
and younger women as sisters with absolute purity after holding godly relationship with all people. And the basis is saying, it is expressly stated by God himself that as young men and young women, we do not, we refrain from rebuking all the people harshly. And for me, because I've been a younger preacher, when the Lord helped me to understand this, it is settled several things in my relationship with all the people. Our society tends to give a lot of leeway when all the people live and God realize. And then young people are not expected to rebuke them. Scripture gives us room to rebuke all the people, except that we should not do it harshly. Are you in the main scripture? So rebuke them, but not harshly. That means there's a measure of wisdom. If another man, another woman is not living according to the truth of God's word, the Lord expects you to face them boldly and courageously, and akwana mundo komundo nos to nos, and rebuke them, but not harshly. In other words, as a young man, as a young woman, who has known the true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, God expects you to defend the same even among all the people. They could even be people in authority. They could be pastors, senior pastors, bishops, apostles, whoever they are. But if they are mishandling the truth of God's word, the Lord expects you to waste uh, uh, draw to them and rebuke them according to the word of God. How do we, how do we uphold godly relationships? Secondly, pursue purity and godliness with all people. And this is particularly important where we are in a society where young people have been ravaged by the invasion of sexual immorality. Scripture tells us for men, this is for all the men in the house. And the men said, yes. 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 For all the men in the house, the Bible clearly tells us, you don't even need the Holy Spirit to interpret these things. He says, treat all the women as your mother. I'm talking to men. Treat every other woman the way you treat your mother and all young women as your sister with absolute purity. That is, do to her or with her only what you can do with your mother or your sister. Say it again. <laughs> Why do you complicate life? All the women, treat them the way you treat your mother. Do with them only what you can do with your mother. But the Spirit of God allowed me to 
The Bible says, teach Christian families, children and grandchildren. Please make sure you see it in your Bible. To take care of their widows. I know I could be saying something else. You could be hearing what I'm not saying. I said widows. Okay? Those are married women whose husbands have died. So whatever else you are hearing, ignore it. Christian families, that is children. If a widow has children or grandchildren who are Christian, it is their business to take care of their widows. Then widows are to be warned against living in pleasure. Which for my say I come back all over. This is difficult for me. 20 years ago, my father went to be with the Lord. I am the firstborn in a big family. I was younger than you can see now. I went to God in prayer, in crying, in desperation. What will happen of my mother? Who will take care of her? And being a preacher then, I was praying and hoping that God can move their church to take care of her. Then in the process of that, I discovered scripture. The Lord commands, if the widow has children who are believing, it is their duty to take care of them. And I boldly and courageously rose from prayer, asking God to give me the courage. But it will become clear in the next one. Because only widows who are over 60 years, who lived well with their husbands, and who have a testimony of godliness and service should be assisted by the church. You did not hear well. Amen. And my mother was not 60 years at that point. So I knew, even if the church would say they want to take care, that is not what scripture says. It is me and my brothers and sisters to take care of her and we have continued so far by the grace of God. Only we, those who are over 60 years, I belong to a very big mega church, Sitam Valley Road. We have several widows. You know the story of Kenya in the 80s and especially in the 90s with the HIV AIDS that ravaged our society, leaving several widows all over. And the churches are like they are not sure what to do. All these widows who are left with us, what do we do? We know the Lord tells us it is good religion to take care of them. But only those who are over 16, those who have lived well with their husbands, those who have a testimony of godliness and service, should be included. Here the next one, ladies and gentlemen, younger widows should be encouraged and counseled to get married. Hallelujah. I know you are young, so please enjoy the truth of God's word. <laughs> Enjoy the truth of God's word as you prepare for your life in the future and your ministry as a Christian. This is again is the teaching of our cultures. Our society tells us, are you never quahio jami? So if the husband dies, who will you wait? Not so scripture. Scripture says, till death do us part. And upon death the covenant is broken. And if she is young, scripture says she should be encouraged to remarry and even get more children. Why? So that their sensual desires do not overcome their dedication to Christ leading to judgment. And this will also help them against becoming idolatrous, ghosts, and busy bodies. In ancient uh, Middle East, uh, up to now, women were desperate without men. Single women depended on their fathers and their brothers, but upon marriage they depended upon their husbands. So should a married wife have the misfortune of having her husband die, then she was desperate without hope because they were not engaged in any gainful engagement. And that is why the issue of widows was extremely so significant. 
and the same Nigeria remains in most of our country, particularly in the rural areas. And therefore, the Lord gives us divine instructions on how to help them. Hallelujah. How do we defend the integrity of the church? Number four, rebuke those who sin publicly as a warning to others. Rebuke those who sin publicly as a warning to others. This is in verse 20 of chapter 5. Those who sin are to be rebuked publicly so that others may take warning. There used to be a program on national TV years ago which was called Voice of Kenya. I do not know whether it was Vio Jabakaman or something like that, you know? And the judge will pass judgment and say, Iri iwe onyo kwa watu wengine wenye tabia kama hii. Koti hii ime kufuku miaka mitatu. Let's come to church and scripture. Iri iwe onyo kwa watu wengine ambao wanaishi tabi. And this is rebuking sinners in public. This is a hard practice. No wonder the church seems to be shy of doing it. But I ask you, how do you handle a sinner or one who practices and teaches false doctrine in the church? How does your church handle sinners and those who are living in false doctrine on priesthood? that has been established in the history of Christianity and of the church, a sin should be confessed to the extent of its influence. If somebody teaches false doctrine to a group of people, the same, must be, the same person must be brought to confess and repent it to the whole group. If somebody sees in a manner that is affecting a group of Christians in the church, the same must be confronted and brought to repent and confess the same publicly. Thus, private sins are hard on privately, but public sins that influence the church of Jesus Christ negatively must be dealt with publicly. And subsequently, I lament personally the sad loss of the practice of communication in our churches today. Let me do a simple survey. Who has ever been in a church where somebody was excommunicated? Just raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, and three, six at the back. Very few people, seven at the front. In a church where somebody was excommunicated. I remember several years ago visiting a preacher who, with whom we used to be housemates many years in our youthful days. And he's currently a bishop in you know, some church in you know, some part of Kenya. I visited him after we were married and parted, and with my wife, with my wife, we went to the church where he was ministering. Well, we, we went late, so when we entered and just sat down, having lost most of the earlier uh, uh, introductions, he said, Mavoni, Simama, with another voice, Mavoni, Simama. And then Mavoni was refusing to stand. And then he said, Mavoni, I say it in the name of Jesus, Simama. <laughs> and Mavoni went up like a drone by some power from above. And as Mavoni stood, the pastor explained, I have talked with Mavoni, the elders have talked with Mavoni. Mavoni is in an ungodly relationship with a young man, and many of you know it is a rumor all over in the village. We have a farm, it's not a rumor, it is not, it is the truth. We have counseled with Mavoni over and over, but she has refused to take the counsel of the word of God. And therefore, according to scripture, we ask Mavoni, walk out! <laughs> you no longer 
belong to the people of God. How do we defend the integrity of the church? Rebuke those who see publicly so that it is a warning on others. Number five, do not delay has history. Do not delay has history on anyone. We speak muti yote mikono of your of you. Because laying on of hands was and still is largely reserved for the appointing or setting apart of leaders. Doing so history means putting the wrong people into leadership. Let me deviate and help you know, according to the teaching of scripture, it is not every time we pray for people, we lay hands on them. We are given situations where people should be laid hands on. We do not lay hands on people for everything. One of the key ones is when setting them apart for leadership positions. It is when imparting spiritual gifts. It is when facilitating the receiving of the Holy Spirit. It is when praying for healing. And we do not therefore have the liberty to keep laying hands of on everyone, everywhere, history. Because there can be spiritual progress. So verse 22 says, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands. Coming from Anaria chapter, chapter 3, that was talking about leadership and even the gift of God that is upon Timothy through the laying on of hands. It means that if you lay hands on people without due consideration, without spiritual diligence and prayer, you could end up putting the wrong people in the leadership. You could end up confusing people in the church and therefore creating space for deceiving spirits to find expression among God's people. And therefore there is a warning, do not, I repeat again, do not just lay hands on anybody, anywhere, anyhow. God does not permit us. And in so doing then, we are told to appoint le appointing leaders may lead to you. Uh, appointing leaders history may lead you sharing in their sins if you do it history. And ladies and gentlemen, as a pastor, I see it over and over again. Churches that are bedeviled by a crisis of leadership, where men and women in leadership uh, the story in the village about that scandal and the other one. And you are wondering how did they in the first place end up in leadership? Because somebody laid hard and had history on them contrary to the will of God. How do we defend the integrity of the church? Number six, I have two more. I should have told you this in the beginning. I have two more. Then you can rest, yeah? Please talk to me. Yes. Number six, develop and pursue biblical work ethics. Develop and pursue biblical work ethics. In chapter six, verse one and two, we are told, all who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Those who are believing masters are not to show less respect for them because they are brothers. Instead, they are to serve them even better because those who benefit from their service are believers and dear to them. Develop and pursue biblical work ethics. Christian employees should respect their bosses. I know you are not employees, but let me repeat it and I want to hear your response. Christian employees should respect their bosses. Yes. This is the word of God. We are, why do we cause confusion? No one should be claim to be a Christian and yet they do not respect their boss. The Lord commands us not because the boss is good, but because we are under authority to respect them. Why do we respect them? So that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. One of the difficult experiences in 
in my ministry is to work with the people who I supervise and are supervised in a, a different places. Somebody is a Christian, is born again, a sister and a brother, but when you look at their work ethic, they need to be fired sooner than they were hired. <laughs> And as a result, they put the Church of Jesus Christ and the teaching of Scripture into disrespect and slander. Equally, Christian employees whose bosses are Christians should not show less respect for them because they are brothers. And this is a crisis in the church because everybody is saved. And we are dada, do we do? What we do? The grace of God, it is by grace, brother, we are here. Yes, it is by grace we are here, but to accomplish a certain purpose, a certain assignment given by God and to do it excellently for God. Hallelujah. Amen. My colleagues are not here, so they have missed to hear this. This would be, have been a good one for those I supervise to hear. That Christian employees whose bosses are also Christians should not respect them with the rest of respect. Because Dugu Najua, last night, Nirikua Naomba, yes, you are praying and casually, but at eight, you come to the office to work and produce. Only one man has understood it. <laughs> Number seven, how do we defend? The integrity of the church by pursuing and living a life of contentment. Pursuing and living a life of contentment. I just have about a few minutes to, to finish this. Beware of anyone who teaches false doctrines because he or she is conceited and understands nothing. Anyone who teaches false doctrine is conceited, meaning is deceived and does not understand anything. What is the connection with contentment? The connection is that those who teach false doctrine are also the ones who misguide God's people to begin pursuing material gain and confusing godliness as a means to financial gain because it's deception. Therefore, we are told to beware of those who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. That is in verse number five. Let me ask all of you, and I want a, a, a caller's answer. Do you know anybody who confuses godliness as a means to financial gain? Yes. The Lord wants us beware of those people who have been robbed of the truth why are they uh, taking godliness as a means to enrich themselves? Why are they taking the church of a kiosk? The truth is, is because they have been robbed of the truth. And we need to look at them with mercy, desiring that the love of God will reach them because truth has been stolen away from them by the devil. And when truth is non-existent, falsehood is left. And falsehood guides them now to begin seeing and viewing godliness as a means to financial gain. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the foundation of the famous prosperity gospel, which is not a gospel after all. We need to appreciate and live in the conviction that godliness with contentment is great gain. I repeat it again, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Would you kindly say that? The point is, appreciate that truth and live under conviction that when you are Godly and you live in contentment by the grace that God has given to you, you have great gain. Why? Because you need to be content with God's wonderful provision of the only basic needs according to scripture, which is food and clothing. And elsewhere in Matthew, it adds water. 
So if the Lord has given you food, water, and clothing, be appreciative to God's wonderful provision and realize that together with the life, you are a blessed man, you are a blessed woman, and you can live in contentment with a godly man as a godly woman, knowing that God is in supreme control over your life. In his wisdom and timing, he can entrust you with a few other things, but those are not the ones you are pursuing in your relationship with him. Do you want to get rich? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for being honest. Do you want to get rich? Yes. Beware that people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. Verse number nine, I've just quoted the Bible. <laughs> Beware that those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. Does that this mean that Christian men and women should not be rich? Not at all. Rather, it is a warning against a world of preoccupation with becoming, uh, with becoming rich because of its potential to wreck the faith. The point here is we become rich by God's provision, not because we are pursuing wealth and money and financial gain in our faith. In other words, our faith is not a means to that, it's a means to godliness, it's a means to a relationship with God. Do you know any rich Christian? Yes. Christians who are rich should be warned not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in wealth, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment, as we read in verse 17. As you can see, I enjoy scripture. It is the truth of God's word. It, it changes my mind and my perspective. It gives me a better world view for godly living, for stable, for balanced living, without hustling to read to peace by the grace of God. And finally, 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 number eight, finally. Remember to keep fighting the good fight of faith. Finally, if you forget everything else, continue, continue fighting the good fight of faith by diligently pursuing righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. By diligently taking hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession and by diligently remaining focused, waiting without spot or brain until the blessed appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. How do we defend the integrity of the church? By living in those eight points, eight truths, eight pillars from God's word. And we say that the book of First Timothy presents an invitation to the Christian to defend the integrity of the church by dealing ruthlessly with the false teachers and upholding true doctrine in personal faith will allow only godly people to read the church. As revealed in these eight practical lessons, we are also demanded to intentionally in, uh, demanded to have intentionality in nurturing God's relationships with all persons will exercise in care not to be drawn away by the lure and the deception of material gain. And all this is to be done with the eager expectation of Christ's soon return according to the scriptures. I close in saying, as we defend the integrity of the faith, uh, sorry, the integrity of the church, we do so with the expectation of Jesus soon return, so that when Jesus comes, he will find faith on us. That faith on us is faith in my heart and faith in the community of believers with whom God has given me fellowship and a faith that together from the church we continue to impart in the society by the grace of God. And this is the truth of God's will. 
We pray that God will give you understanding as we reflect on the same as a young man, as a young woman, to live and to pass the same in all the days that God will entrust you as his believer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.